<laughs> so the first fly I'm going to do is a pattern of mine called the Clearwater pupa. It's a, an epoxy style uh, coronament pupa that are very popular over in England. And they're popular in England because they sink fast. And many of the waters, and particularly it's a very competition-driven still water fishery over there, you're not allowed to use bead heads. So they use patterns that are uh, very slender and, and hard-bodied. And they were coated with epoxy, but... There's a number of different materials. I'm just going to show you a couple uh, different ones you can use. I keep it. I, I, I've gone complicated and gone back to simple. So anyway, so in the vise, I've got got any curved scud hook. I tie this uh, not only on scud hooks but straight shanked hooks. I'll use scud hooks if the hatch is on and you know the the coronament pupa are active and wiggling and starting their ascent. But early in the emergence, <clears throat> you'll find coronaments just stage above the bottom gathering the, tra the, the gases necessary so they can elevate and they're not, they don't wiggle very much. So I use more straight shanked hooks in those situations and, and there are circumstances the fish will pick one shank hook over the other and I hate them when they do that. So <laughs> Anyway, so in this particular one, I've, this is, kill me for this, this is an old Oliver Edwards um, emerger hook. I can't remember what the hell it's called. Dennis probably knows. You use a longer shank, do you? No, it's just a curved scud hook. You could use a C49S, you could use a CO68, a 2457, whatever Daiichi's is. Um, you could use a standard shank uh, hook as well. So don't get hung up on the hook because you can tie it. Again, think about whether the coronament are more, the pupa are more active and starting to, as to ascend, where you know the curved hooks help suggest under a loop not more their, their motion, and a straight shanked hook might be a little. Uh, um, more representative of pupa staging. Oh God, what have I done with my wire? Oh yeah, it's right in front of me. So, hey, Jack. shut up. <laughs> oh. No, no. Oh. Somebody get a time on that before seven? <laughs> Be one of those nights, eh? Yes, Hostile crowd. I love it. Oh good. There goes my wire. That never happens, right? So I'm just tying on, just tying on some very fine uh, copper wire. And I tie it down the side of the shank, all the way down. And the thread color is important on this fly. You could tie this this fly with um, just thread for the body. So you don't. This is why you coil your wire up because it's on there so darn tight. That if you take it off, it'll totally. I've had some spools of wire actually totally disengage from the spool, which is interesting. So anyway, that's tied on uh, for the body. I'm just going to use some of the. Stillwater Solutions um, Midge Braid. Um, just to show how you use it, a lot of people, it's one of the most, on my website, it's one of the most common questions I ask, what is Midge Braid or Frostbite and how the hell do I use it? So it's a, it's a uh, woven flashaboot-like material. Uh, it makes great shellbacks and wing cases. I do it on mayfly nymphs and small damsel nymphs. But it, it also gained popularity um, for coronamid bodies. Now if we tied it in like this, it's way too thick. So what we do is I take about an inch or so and grab each end and just sort of pull on it gently and it unravel. And typically it unravels into two strands. If it completely unravels, it's a miracle, go buy lottery tickets. So, mm -hmm. But what it ends up is two strands held together by a knot at this end. <coughs> I'm assuming this is all on camera and then these two open strands. Now the challenge of tying this stuff in is it still retains its memory. So the first <coughs> order of business is just to get it on the hook shank. So the way I do that is I just come underneath the hook with the th and they put the material between me and the th hanging thread and then just bring it up and lift it into position and drop one more wrap of thread over it and it's on the hook. Okay, so don't try and hold it between your fingers and go insane trying to tie it on the hook that way. Now I've got it on, now I just gotta play a little poker. 21 and know when to hold them. And it, Cause I... You're gonna burn yourself. No, I'm not. <laughs> I stop now, I can see it. Glasses help. A couple of months ago, it would have been a disaster. So I'll trim the end of that off, and now all I'm gonna do, a few extra wraps, cause everything happens when you're demonstrating. And now I've taken that material, and it's held the two strands are held together by the thread and the knot at, one, at the other end and they're going to behave themselves. So we're just going to go down the hook shank, watching out for the hook so point. So is that olive also? Sorry? Olive? Oak olive? Or no, this one's, this is the brown. Uh, brown. brown cotton. Yeah. yeah, and you could use tying thread. Don't, I'm just showing you how to use this material. You want to choose a material for this fly 
because it's really critical to keep this fly skinny because it gets its bulk from the body coating you're going to give it. All right, so this is thin. So this unraveled frostbite, for me, the bigger the hook you get, the more challenging it is to make the body this way, and about a 12 2X is about as big as you can do it. After that, there's other materials you can use. And again, you can use flashaboo, mid-stretch floss, super-stretch floss, tying thread, crystal flash, whatever. Typically what drives me uh, for my coronamid colors is the, obviously the natural color I'm trying to imitate and the material I find it in. I don't really get all hung up and tie one because there's different dye lots for different materials and different colors and things like that. So now I trim this off and hope to God that it doesn't come unraveled. And it didn't. I got a little bit of a stub left over. Trim that off. So, so far, this looks like a standard coronamid pupa. Now I'm just going to go, I'll take one complete wrap around the base and then just open spirals. I don't care how many body segments a coronamid pupa has. I want mine to look abnormal. You know, I, I, sometimes people get a little carried away with their real, the realism. And I always think the goal of the exercise is to get your fly found and chewed on, not to hide it amongst 60,000 natural pupa. So it's good to, ex I, I like to exaggerate certain features, you know, and it's arbitrary how I do it. Maybe it's a bigger head, longer legs, fatter this, skinnier that, or a little bit of color, a little hot spot on it, like hot orange or chartreuse or something, just to make my fly stand out a little bit and get punished. So now I'm going to put some gills on, and I'm just going to use some of the midge gill, and I deliberately tie it long because this becomes my handle. And the important thing about tying the gills in is make sure you leave space between the gills and the hook eye. Don't tie them tight up against the eye. And this stuff gets a little stringy sometimes, so a little spit doesn't hurt anything. So I'm just going to tie that and then just use the tying thread to bind this down. And the thread is forming the thorax here, so I'm trying to keep everything neat and smooth all the way through. And then we'll come back up a little bit, make sure that's on top, get all the fuzz out of it. And then we're going to use, uh, this is again optional, depending, some days I tie them with and without. In, if I was, most of the waters around here, I do put this on because our waters you know, have lots of algae and things in them. So I'll put some... Uh, whether it's this mirage tinsel or pearl tinsel, or sometimes in crystal clear water, I'd probably go to more of the pearl colors because it's not as bright as this mirage stuff. And sometimes I just skip it all together. Sometimes it's just a question I couldn't find at my tying bench, so I skipped it. <laughs> How's that for science? Whoa! God, I've hung around Jack too long. <laughs> One weekend and I can't tie. All right, so that's off there. So I'm just tying this stuff on. This is the... Uh, you could use um, crystal flash too, or anything on top. Just a little bit of flash. This is size small, on top, <coughs> secured. We'll put that in there, and back up again. And again, you can, hopefully the camera shows it, but I'm trying to keep everything as skinny as I can and be as economical as I can. Now I'm gonna imitate the wing pads, and you can use um, you know, at times I've used red holographic mylar, right, which chronomids don't have holographic red ring, wing pads, but again, you're just adding a bit of accent. But at times when they're, um, when they're swollen up, they're, the wings, wing pads are kind of a, either this uh, orangey brown or even this bright orange. And again, I'm trying to make mine stand out. So I'm just going to take the super stretch floss and double it around the tying thread grab both ends, get it in place on the underside of the hook, and now I'm pulling on it. All the way down, right to where I secured the wing case. And they're just gonna hang there. And then come back up. And again, try not to crowd the eye, pull this over on top couple of wraps to secure and oftentimes I'll just take it and kind of wiggle it, have a look, make sure it's centered on top, fold it back, trim off the excess. I'm not using a lot of thread wraps because the body coating is going to totally envelop this so you're just trying to tie things in to hold it in place. 
And you can do these one at a time, which is probably the easiest way. You just bring them up. And actually, if you can, I prefer, and again, it, truthfully, it varies if I've been disciplined enough to myself. I like to tie them off in front of the, um, the gills because it helps stand them up. So I'm just going to pull that one up this side and then take this one, weave the thread through, and pull on it. Now I'm pulling on them, but I'm not pulling very tight. Because if you do, I find if you pull on them tight and then whip finish and then trim off the ends, because they're under tension, they come out, and now you got little swimmerettes. So. <laughs> it's a Boatman chronomet cross. So we'll give it a gamble. This is Murphy's Law. So I pull on them a bit. God, I'm nervous because I didn't do what I typically do and I recommend whenever you're tying with, yeah, see, whenever you're tying with stretchy material, I'm going to redo these, whenever you're tying with stretchy material, you should put a whip finish in and mine sprung just to prove a point. That was a teaching point. <laughs> this stuff never happens at home, so that's no big deal. <laughs> Proves I'm human. <laughs> You've never been to my house, that's all I am is human. <laughs> <coughs> So again, we'll just unravel so you get to see this all again in living color. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll actually just trim that bit off. So that's there. So again, we just do the same thing. That's classified as a side gill? No, it's a wing pad. You that underneath. Oh, pad. Wing yeah. pad. Yeah. So what we're imitating here is a bit of on top. And again, just a, this, this technique of just picking something up, placing the material between you and the thread that's hanging, lifting it up into position on top and then putting the thread wrap on eliminates you having to try and grab and hold it. You have I find you have much more control with the material and then you can sort of pull it into to length to eliminate waste and then back down and then back up and you took a hold of this one. And then these are going to imitate the wing pad so around the tying thread Double, and just secure them. And I'm just trying to do one wrap next to the other, all the way down. And again, you can, you know, sometimes depending on the coronamid pupa, there's the small lime green ones that you'll get on lakes like Miller. They often, they'll have a bright green, almost chartreuse body with a black thorax. So you can play around with, you know, there's lots of, don't get hung up on the colors I'm using on this particular pattern right now because they change. That's the fun and the curse of coronamids. So when you bring those forward, you're trying to come along the side. Along the side, I'm coming up, on the side. up the sides like this. And then because I wasn't paying attention, we'll take the wing pad. But you can do this sometimes because it saves you, it's kind of an economy. With each wrap, I'm doing something so I don't build up thread bulk. Again, we'll just come up on this side. There we go. And you just wiggle them. See, that one didn't want to play right. That's fine. We'll just put another wrap on top. And you can move the beauty of a vise that rotates. You can pull and play and, and get it where it wants. Now, I'm going to take, I'm actually going to whip finish the fly right now. A little bit tricky. One wrap around, and then a couple in front. Sure, I created it. You know, this is why alcohol was invented. <laughs> you got that right. Come on. And it always happens, you know, when you got no work in space, you're trying to impress upon let's keep everything thrifty, you don't want to build up bulk, and I got <laughs> half a uni on the fly. It always happens when you want to clear your head. Yeah. The alcohol keeps the thread from breaking. No, but it keeps me sane. <laughs> and my standards drop considerably. <laughs> All right. And then we're just going to hope to God everything turns out. And just pull on things. And I'm leaving. I'm not going to trim the gills right now. Because this becomes my handle. I need a little bit too much fuzz there. Oh, well. So the first step I do is coat the body with... Instant crazy glue. 
or the Loctite stuff, whatever you like. And I go right on the thorax first <laughs> because I want to glue that sucker down. <laughs> now she's done. Now I'll put a coat there. And we're going to let that dry and we'll come back to that after I tie another fly. So this is the kind of thing, I'll show you how I build this in stages. And this is why the gills are left long. Uh -huh. Building this one in stages. We'll attach him to... No, we're just going to pass him around because I'm going to need these hackle pliers. So start there. So now we're just going to, and again, the coatings are endless on these things. You're just looking for something for a shiny coating. So I've given time for that um, super glue to kick off. And now you're just going to put a coat of, of the Sally Hansons on the body, and particularly on the thorax, in the little valley in between. And we're just going to start building this up. And I have actually a battery operated little rotary dryer. I'm going to just spin that around a little bit. Let that kick so it doesn't sag. I'm going to clip that. See that UV glowing through there? Just perfect. 